Hey, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are today. Um, I'm Chris Hines. I'll be your host today. And um, today we're going to talk about what's new in Docker Data Center. And I'm also joined with Vivek Sarasvat. So, Vivek, do you want to say hi to the, to the audience today? Hey, everybody. My name is Vivek. Uh, I'm a product manager on the Docker Data Center team. So I'll be walking through some of the features that are in this newest release of Docker Data Center. Awesome. Then Matt Bentley is on his way. He'll join us uh, about midway through, and he'll show the demo of some of the new features that Vivek will be talking about. Um, Matt Bentley is um, an engineer at the company, so we're looking forward to having him join as well. And uh, before we get started today, um, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this presentation today, so you have the opportunity to rewatch it um, or share it with anyone that you'd like. What we'll do is send up a follow-up email, what's today, Thursday, so probably Monday of next week. So get it via email, and then you can go and forward it to whoever you want. Um, also, we will have time for questions and answers today um, towards the end of the presentation. So we'll try to save the last like 15, 10, 15 minutes or so um, for any questions from the audience. Um, you can post questions throughout the presentation using the WebEx portal here. There's like a little Q&A chat box. If you had a little time to play around with the UI, you might have noticed it. You can post questions there throughout as they come up. Um, so I'm sure they will, but uh, just know that we won't be actually like addressing them and answering them until uh, the end of the presentation. So we're not ignoring you. We'll get to them as many as we can, but um, just so you know. And with that being said, I think I'll go ahead and kick things off. Right. So um, last year, um, we did a survey where we talked through kind of what were the key enterprise use cases that were taking place, um, and we found that there were really three that stood stood out, right? So you have this concept of app modernization. Um, sometimes we call it here like modernizing traditional apps, right? You have these existing app applications that are typically monoliths, and you're looking to then containerize them and benefit from the benefits of security within containers, of, a, of portability, as well as some of the cost savings that could come out of the optimization of your infrastructure as well. Um, we saw that about three out of the four folks that we um, Survey right out of the survey of 500 people, um, we're looking at Docker to help them do that. Um, we also saw this um, the increase in the amount of folks who are now trying to go DevOps, right? That cultural shift where you're breaking down the barrier between um, developers and operations teams there. Um, so using Docker to build that end-to-end -end kind of CI/CD pipeline, if you will, and then cloud, right? So this is a big one. I'm sure a lot of you on this cloud or on this call are you know looking at. Um, adopting cloud strategies like hybrid cloud or even multi-cloud as well. Um, so um, Docker can help you do that as well, and we're going to kind of talk about that in a second. But um, we're building a – we built a platform called Docker Data Center that enables these initiatives to take place for the enterprise team. Um, so I know a lot of you are familiar with Docker Data Center, but um, for those of you who are just kind of hopped on and because you're interested about the platform, it's – it's really a, a think of it as an end-to-end -end platform, right? It's an enterprise container management platform um, that is fully supported by Docker, right? And it has all the tools that your developers need to build apps, and then your IT operations folks need to actually go and manage them, deploy them, and build out a standardized environment um, within your company. So um, here's a quick kind of snapshot of what that stack looks like. Um, all of this runs on the Docker engine. So the Docker engine is the thing that actually installs in the kernel within the operating system. Uh, it can be Linux or Windows um, Server 2016. And it has the flexibility to run in any environment. So a lot of times you'll see like that tagline of build, ship, run anywhere. That's why, right? The engine itself can run in the public cloud, within a VM, or on a bare metal server as well. Um, and we've taken some of the, within the new releases that we have, like with 112 previous to this and now 113, um, where we have the built-in orchestration features, um, which was basically Swarm, right? How you actually, um, the, you know, the, and the Docker Engine clustering tool, if you will. Um, there's some networking advancements, volumes, as well as plugins that are available. Um, and then the registry itself. So Docker Trusted Registry is a secure way to store um, your image content, right? It deploys on-prem. Um, it's fully supported by us, but you have the ability to kind of um, create a centralized location Right, from, from an ITF standpoint, where you can secure your applications, but then enable devs to come in and self-service and, and pull from those base images to build new applications on top of them. Um, and then you have universal control plane. So this is, think of this as a management layer. Um, this is how you orchestrate, this is how you manage, this is how you deploy, this is how you scale your containers, um, your, your services. 
um, your nodes within your environment, all from like a really cool GUI, um, which we'll talk through as well. And then the security pieces. So part of this big release was around um, secrets, but I, I don't want to spoil Vivek's um, you know, splash here, but secrets. Uh, we also announced uh, Docker security scanning as well as some advancements in RBAC, but uh, I'll let Vivek talk through some of those. But this is just kind of like a snapshot of what Docker Data Center is, right? This is a commercial platform, right? It's um, there, there is a, a price tag associated with it, right? So it's not the open source software that um, you might be familiar with. This is a paid solution. Um, and just lastly, I want to kind of walk through what that actual workflow would look like. So um, we talk about build, chip, run, right? This platform enables, um, this is the kind of the cast, we call it containers as a service workflow, right? So um, we enable developers to use their laptops and, you know, with uh, you know, Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows installed on it, easily create Dockerized images. Those images are then pushed to a secure registry, right, Docker trusted registry. And on that push, there's a series of um, security features or security kind of um, guards that we can set, things like signing and now scanning as well. Um, now your images are stored in a centralized location, and when your IT ops team is ready to then run them in production, they can pull them and run them um, using universal control plane, um, which um, can deploy those services across or workloads across um, the cluster, right? That can be in the cloud, that could be on-prem, and you have that full portability between those cloud and on-prem environments as well, really enabling things like hybrid. So think of it as the ship point there is that central location and really the handoff point between developers and IT operations folks. And what I want to do here is actually pass the ball to Vivek, and Vivek will start to talk to you some of the, the new features that we released um, with Docker Data Center 1.13 and Docker Security Scanning last, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago now. So um, Vivek, the rock is yours. Um, sounds good. Now let me just make sure my screen is being shared correctly. Chris, can you confirm? You can see what's on my screen? I'll take Looks that idea. Here. All right, thank you. So hey everyone, uh, let's talk through some of the new features that have come in this release on Docker Data Center on Docker 1.13. Quick quick uh, overview of versionings for this release of Docker Data Center. So this is based on Docker Engine 113, the commercially supported version. Um, it's UCP version 2.1 and DTR version 2.2 for those keeping track. So in this release, we really focused on three major areas for improvement. The first was around improved end-to-end -end application security. Uh, and there's a couple of areas that we looked into for this. The first big feature here, uh, mainly on the UCP side of the house, is secrets management. This is the ability to inject confidential data, like passwords or certificates, directly into a running container uh, to store them securely on the cluster and then inject them into a running container as needed and provide security and access control around which users are allowed to access and see these secrets. And I'll talk about that in more detail. The second big feature, and this is more on the DTR side of the house, is the on-premises image scanning and vulnerability monitoring. Uh, the ability to look into a Docker image, run it against known CVE databases, and find out what errors and vulnerabilities are in that image. And the final is additional access control features around secrets as well as volumes, the storage-based storage constructs within the Docker world. The second big area that we really focused on with this release was enhanced usability. Now, this is broad, but the idea is both from an application standpoint and from a user standpoint, what are things that can make it easier for users within Docker Data Center to get their workflows done? Uh, the first big one is Compose for Services, the ability to create uh, user compose files to create service-based uh, applications called stacks. Uh, image content cache, this is the ability to create satellite content caches within DTR so you can have faster pull-throughs with lower latency in remote locations. Uh, HTTP, HTTP routing mesh now generally available. Uh, so this, this is uh, the ability to route host names directly to services. It was an experimental feature and now it's GA and we'll talk to the improvements there. Registry webhooks, the ability to receive notif uh, API-based notifications for certain registry functions and we'll walk through the, what those are. And finally, cluster level and node level metrics directly from your universal control plane UI. So getting a sense of resource usage within your cluster. So that's for enhanced usability. Finally, we made a couple of improvements around making it more easy to get started on Docker Data Center. 
The first is the ability to construct a custom DT, uh, Docker Trusted Registry install command directly from the UCP UI to quickly get a uh, DTR bootstrap and running. Uh, and the second is a series of templates for AWS and Azure to really spin up a more quick, uh, a, full, a fully highly available Docker data center deployment in the cloud for evaluation purposes in, in a very quick time frame. Okay, so those are the high-level features. Let's walk through them one by one. So the first major area we talked about was improved application security. So what are the key components of container security? It all starts with having a usable security system. So having a series of tooling that is secure by default. So by default, you know, only the users who are permitted access to a resource are able to actually use that resource. And this has to be native to both dev and ops. So both sides of the house really need to be using the same security tool works that everyone believes that uh, the system is secure. Added to the usable security is really trusted delivery. Now, does your application have everything it needs to be fully functional, delivered in a safe manner, and guaranteed not to be tampered with? And this really gets into what the secrets and scanning uh, features that we're going to talk about have added to this release. Finally, this all needs to be infrastructure independent. You know, if your security system works on a cloud-based deployment but not a non-prem deployment or vice versa, then something's going wrong. Um, as, an, as an IT operator, you need to have the, the insurance to know that no matter where you choose to run your Docker environment, you know, all those things that are in your system are in the app platform. They can move across the infrastructure without disrupting the app and, importantly, without disrupting the security. So if you put all, these, all of these areas together, you get safer applications and safer infrastructure. And this is what the series of features in Docker Data Center are all about. So let's talk about the integrated secrets management feature. Um, the way that it works is that in the new uh, Docker 113 swarm mode, uh, you can securely store secrets directly on the cluster. They're encrypted and they're stored uh, within the wrapped consensus group that holds together the swarm managers. And it's not like it's hidden in a file where anyone can pick up. These secrets are sharded around and they're, you know, from impossible by normal means to simply grab from a cluster. So from a management standpoint in Docker Data Center, admins can add, remove, list, update all the secrets in the cluster, and they can do this directly from the GUI. Then users or admins are able to inject a secret directly into a Docker service. And this can either be done at runtime or it can be done any time after by editing and, and restarting the service. Uh, each secret, the, the secret is exposed to each task within that, uh, within that service via a default t uh, slash run slash secret tempfs volume. Importantly, this is in memory. Nothing is saved to the disk on these hosts. Uh, but it's exposed to the container in a way that those secrets are now read readable in a plain text file. Uh, authorization, you can, within Docker Data Center, you can tag secrets to a specific service. So you can say only this service is allowed to see the secret, and that means that no other service on the, on the, uh, on the cluster can just grab those secrets. So while the, the, the file itself is exposed in plain text, the secret is encrypted uh, and it's fully in memory. So again, only accessible to that small portion of the container that's allowed to see it. Also with Docker Data Center, admins can authorize via our role-based access control mechanism which users and teams have access to that secret. Uh, and this works via the same access control label-based mechanism that's used across other parts of the product. Using the GUI, you can also quickly rotate and update secrets uh, with, to all containers in a service just by editing a service and starting uh, and changing the secret or replacing the secret. Uh, you can also audit requests for that secret. So using the syslog feature built into UCP where you send out all of your logging data to something like an ELK stack, you can figure out which users tried to request secret access, uh, which users were given access to a secret, all of that's available for logging purposes. So really the secrets management feature provides you a convenient and easy and secure way to ensure that a application receives the necessary confidential information that it needs to run. But even before you get to the ability to run that application, how do you ensure that the application code itself is safe and secure? This is where the new Docker security scanning feature comes in and which really provides you with safer applications. So this is an integrated scanning tool and vulnerability monitoring that's uh, built in directly into Docker Trusted Registry. Uh, what it does is it allows you to provide binary level, level scanning of an image and provides deep visibility into the components. So it takes, and, and we'll probably, we'll see this in, in, in Matt's workflow later, but it takes a, 
a single image breaks down into the various layers and components that are built into that image, uh, runs, runs the code, machine-readable code, against known CVE databases, and then gives you a sense of what the level of vulnerabilities are in that image. So CVE databases tend to use, use a 1 through 10 numbering system for severity. So you could say 1 through 3 would be a minor, 4 through 6 would be a major, and 7 through 10 is critical. So you get a full list out of so-called bill of materials of all the layers in your cluster and the level of vulnerabilities within that image. This is a continuous process. The, the, scanning, the scanning happens, uh, can be set to happen on a daily basis. It can be set to happen every time an image is pushed, and you can do manual scanning as necessary. So you can customize the policies and configurations you want. You can set which repos you want to have scanning. You don't have to enable them by all if you want to, and which users have access to that scanning. Uh, and importantly, it's not that the images are scanned just once. You, vulnerabilities are found all the time in the field and updated on these databases. So you can, your images are continually scanned and uh, any new vulnerabilities that are found are then checked against that image. You can find vulnerabilities as they are discovered in the field and you can update the CVE databases uh, either via uh, online uh, automatic renewal or via an offline package. And finally, to top off what we've uh, added on the security side of the house in this release, we've improved our access control in two different areas. We've added granular label-based access control, similar to what you already have for services, networks, and containers today, to now to secrets and volumes. So access control labels for secrets, uh, again, it works the same way with the com.docker.usb.access.label. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that to use a secret with a service, either they must both have the same access control label, like production in this case, or they must both have no access control label at all. This ensures that your users are guaranteed to have, if they have access to one, they need to have access to both. We've also added access control labels for volumes. There's a slight difference for this one in order to maintain backwards compatibility in that unlabeled volumes are able to be accessed by all users. It's a little bit different from how other unlabeled resources work. They're visible only to users that created them as well as all admins for other resources, although this is something that we're updating in future releases. But again, now you have additional granular-based control and the ability to uh, hide access to volumes and to secrets. Now let's move on to some of the enhanced usability features within the platform. The first one, which I'm quite excited about, is Compose for Services. So with Docker 1.13, we added the Compose file 3.1, uh, or 3.0 format, and now the 3.1 format. This allows you to deploy what we call stacks. A stack is a, can be consist, uh, is a, uh, a, uh, a Docker construct that consists of services, volumes, networks, and secrets. Uh, so you can deploy those by creating a Compose YAML 3.1 file and in the CLI using the Docker stack deploy command or in the UI using the deploy uh, on the stacks and applications page. You can now also manage and monitor stacks directly from the UCP UI. So you'll see here on the screen you see application and stack. Applications use the older container-based, a Docker run container-based format, and stacks use the new services-based format. So you can see exactly from the UI how many services, volumes, and networks are in each stack or application. You can click directly into it, and you can manage and monitor, restart, delete all of these applications directly from the UI. So a really powerful way to view and manage your service-based applications. Another new feature we've added on usability is the image content cache. So this is a common request from uh, customers using the Docker Trusted Registry. Let's say, for example, you have a Docker, you, your major company is located in, say, San Francisco, and you have your Docker Trusted Registry uh, in a data center in San Francisco. However, let's say you have a satellite office in New York. Doing, pull, doing pulls of huge images from the DTR uh, registry located in San Francisco, for example, one or two or three gigabyte images, might have a higher latency when you're all the way across the uh, all the way across the country. So with the new content cache feature, you can create a satellite cache. Now this itself is a mini registry that uh, authenticates client requests back to the upstream DTR. So a user can configure to uh, make a request for a certain image from the say this new content cache located in New York. Uh, that content cache will send uh, authentication requests directly to the upstream DTR in San Francisco, redirect to the, to, back to, to the cache, and then pull down the, uh, the image that you need. This allows you to have lower latency pulls for subsequent pulls of that image. So let's say you have a 10 gigabyte image, it'll pull down to the new content cache once, 
Now, every subsequent pull is going to be from that content cache. That'll be a lot quicker for users who are in remote location. What's more, if you ever add additional tags to that image that have a minor diff, say out of that 10 gigabyte image, only 100 megabyte change, all you need to do is, is uh, add that diff to the content cache, or it'll automatically be done when you do a pull through. So you'll have faster pull throughs. You can actually do cache chaining. So you can have multiple content caches chained to multiple DTRs in a number of configurations, depending on what's useful for your business. And users can pick the cache that's most appropriate for them. So really this is a way to, if you have one central DTR or a couple central DTRs, and you really want some satellite images for faster, or satellite registries for faster pulls, the content cache feature can make that happen for you. Another big feature here around application ease of use is the built-in HTTP routing mesh. So a common request from users with the new Docker service command is, okay, I can use the existing TCP routing mesh in form mode that allows me to expose a port and then make that visible for a single service across any node in the cluster. But what a lot of people said is, hey, I need to be able to route via host names. I need to be able to route via a URL. Uh, for example, foo.com needs to route to service foo. Uh, so we added a feature in the previous version of UCP, but it was experimental, called the HTTP routing mesh, that allows you to do this host name based routing. Uh, since then, in this newest release, we've made that GA, so this is fully available for production. And we've added a couple of additional features to make this easier to use. For starters, we added HTTPS support via SNI protocol. So this allows you to do HTTPS support now uh, using port 443 or port of your choice. Now, specifically, this is, this is uh, pass through search, so your application must do termination of the, of, of the search at this time. We've also added support for multiple HRM networks. In the previous version, you had a single network that connected all of the, all the services that need to be routed using HRM. But in order to enhance app isolation, let's say you don't want services seeing each other on the same overlay network, you can now set up multiple HRM networks, and you can set up which users have access to those networks using the granular label-based access control. In addition, uh, we've had the ability to route using an external load balancer, so you can set up a load balancer, whether it's something like an F5 uh, physical load balancer or an Nginx uh, container-based load balancer to route host names to nodes. And you can also add these host name routings directly via the UI. So when you click publish port when you're deploying or editing a service, you can actually uh, set up the host name routing directly from there. You don't have to set up the labels via CLI or manually. So really, it's very convenient and easy to add this feature to your services. Importantly, this is for the new Docker service format. For uh, Docker run style non-service containers, you can continue to use the interlock reference architecture that we built for previous versions of the UCP. And you can run this side by side with services running HRM. For DTR, we've also added uh, the ability to do webhooks for registry events. So what this is, is you can subscribe to notifications for specific types of repo tag and system events. Uh, and here's a couple of examples. Tag uploaded, deleted, or the repos, the manifest uploaded and deleted, uh, creating or deleting repos, uh, starting and ending garbage collection, security scanning events. So why is this important? Well, let's say you have a CI, a continuous integration, continuous deployment system, and you want to be notified when a new tag is uploaded to a specific repository. So you go from a 1.0 to 1.1 version. That way you can trigger a, say, a container deploy on your universal control plane build. Using the new webhooks feature, you can do that. You can, check, you can subscribe by API, get, man, uh, get a notification when a new tag is created, and use that to trigger, say, a deploy of your choice. So this gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility to build additional automated functionality within your build, ship, and run deployment. Uh, and note that we've added these events. We're going to continue to add more in the future. You can, see, uh, you can expect notary events coming as part of webhooks in a future release. Finally, another nice little feature we've added in the Universal Control Plane UI is additional node-based metrics. So if you look at the new dashboard in UCP, you'll see, uh, you'll see a new set of rows around CPU, memory, and storage usage within the cluster. And you can also, if you look on the node page, you can look at individual CPU, memory, and storage metrics for each node. You can also sort the list of nodes via usage metrics. So if you want to quickly get a sense of, hey, which of my nodes are, are nearly filled up with disk space. You can do that with a single click and a single filter and sort. So just a really, a really easy and quick way to get a sense of usage within your cluster. And with some of the features we've built in the latest releases of Docker Data Center, it's, it's you know, more easy than ever to get started with, uh, you know, with evaluating and building this platform. 
So one of the first things we did in this newest release is the ability to install DTR directly from the UCB UI or to build a custom install command. Um, this is ideal for first-time installs for people who may not be as familiar with how DTR works. So when you, once you've created a USB cluster and you've added nodes, if you go to the admin settings tab, there's a little, a little sub tab called DTR. And from this, if you haven't already installed DTR on the cluster, you can quickly set the external URL, the UCP node, uh, if you want to sign this as replica ID, um, and you want to add either the PEM certificate for your UCP or just do an insecure install for, for evaluation purposes, you'll see here on the screen, you can quickly get the command that you need to copy and paste and run within the node to install DTR. So again, all of this is set up for you, the node is set up for you, username set up with you. It makes uh, your life a lot easier if you've never installed DTR before to quickly get up and running. Also, we've added a series of templates for AWS and Azure that make it really, really simple to uh, install uh, an entire DDC cluster. So once you've set up a trial for, for uh, DDC using going to docker.com slash trial, you can, uh, once you've gotten your license key, you can choose which infrastructure. Today it's Azure, AWS, and as well as manual install Linux servers. Uh, with a pre-selected template, you click a couple of defaults, how many managers, for example, you want, what's the password, your, your authentication key for your cloud service, and within minutes, it will spin up for you a fully, uh, a fully set up Docker data center cluster with a load balancer with UCP and DTR uh, wired up and integrated. Uh, that's good to go and run. So it's a great way to get started with DDC and get a sense of how it works in a highly available environment. So that's what I've got on the features within Docker data center. I, I'm gonna pass this off to Chris very quickly to talk through the pricing and packaging summary. Chris? Uh, yep, totally. Thank you, Vivek, for um, taking us through the new features. Um, I'll probably just, I'll make this quick, y'all, and then we can get into the demo from Matt here. Um, but there are several new versions, right? So I won't say several new, but there's a, an additional version that we've introduced with the new edition of Docker Security Scanning. Um, so think of it as like um, like a basic, a standard, an advanced kind of feel. Right? So you have like CS Engine, which is basically support for the engine. You see the pricing there for um, our two support levels, which are business day and business critical. Uh, business day is exactly what it says there. It's at 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, local time. Um, business critical is 24-7. Um, the next layer up from that is Docker Data Center, right, which is what we're talking about here. And you get support for you know, the engine, you get you know, UCP, DTR. Um, and then um, the additional one that we've added in is this Docker Data Center plus Docker security scanning, which Vivek talked about. Um, which is like that scanning feature or that provides bi level scans of the layers within the image. And then you see the pricing for business day and business critical for those. Um, so I, I know typically we get a lot of questions around what's the pricing here, so I want to make sure that we covered the slide. Um, again, I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but there, if there are questions to this, feel free to post them in the Q&A piece and I can um, address them. This, this is a pricing uh, model is based on uh, per node. So think of it as like per VM, per cloud instance, um, per bare metal. Um, the caveat with bare metal is that um, the limit is two CPUs. Once you exceed two CPUs, um, there's an additional cost. But again, if there's more questions, um, do let me know. At this point, what I'll do is actually share the ball with Matt, and Matt can take us through um, a demo. So Matt, you now have the presenter privileges. All right, fantastic. I'll give it a second just to make sure my screen is shared. It is shared. Okay, fantastic. So I'll be highlighting some of these new features that uh, we've talked about today. So feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section and uh, we can go over some of those uh, after we're done. So we can certainly drill down onto a few topics that uh, I think uh, might get a lot of questions, but uh, feel free to ask away and I will answer as best as possible. So. Particularly, I want to focus on some of the features uh, uh, around security. So one of the first things that uh, I'd like to talk about and show is the scanning features in Docker Trusted Registry. Um, in a lot of the conversations that I have, the, the question came around, when can we do scanning on-prem behind the firewall, completely separated off within my own Docker Trusted Registry? So Docker Hub has been great for scanning images um, today. So Docker Store content is all scanned, but uh, from the standpoint of I want to be able to scan my own content, that's what we're aiming to do here with uh, on the Docker Trusted Registry. So just as an example here, I have my DTR populated with a bunch of uh, base images. 
So in this case, I pulled these images from uh, Docker Hub and other various sources to be able to uh, see you know, and provide a set of content that my, my team, my developers can begin working from. So instead of going to public content sources, I'm really controlling what they have access to. So let's look, actually look at the official CentOS image that uh, I pulled in at some point uh, previously. So in this case, this is a fairly bare bones repository, but looking at images, I can see information about what is available in my registry. So here I pulled in an image and pushed it into the Docker Trusted Registry, uh, specifically knowing it had some vulnerabilities so we can get some visibility onto what's in there. So first of all, we can see that it is signed. So that way we're digitally, uh, in, digitally signing this Docker image so that I can say for certain where it came from and who pushed that into the registry. So we can talk about that a little bit later, but that also gives us the capability to understand at runtime, only run content that is signed by this specific key or set of users that have signed the image. But to look more into the vulnerabilities, so here we can see that we do have vulnerabilities that were identified. So if we look at the details, we get a layer by layer analysis of this Docker image that has been built. So if we look at these individual layers, we can see that this layer is just defining the maintainer. But in the second layer, we have a number of vulnerabilities that have been identified. So looking through this, we can see that we've created a bill of materials through the scanner. The scanner goes through and at the binary level, determines what exactly is in this Docker image. So there are some things that we cannot identify the versions, but uh, for example, the PCRE was identified here twice, but the second time we're actually able to identify that version. So on the things that we haven't been able to identify that version, it will show any vulnerabilities that exist for that component. But if we drill down into that specific version, we can see that we have identified this set of vulnerabilities. So if I need to find more information about a vulnerability to find out you know, what, what exactly is it doing? What was the cause of it? Is it fixed? I can actually drill down into the CVE to see more information about that. In addition, we pull in the severity from the vulnerability database that is provided. So these come from the standard CVE sources so here I can read about this specific vulnerability, find out more about it, see if I'm actually impacted. You know, is it a feature that I'm actually using or not? So by clicking on that specific version of uh, PCRE here, it actually brought me to the components section. So if I want to browse on a per component basis, I can do that. So for example, if you had a Docker image where I had previously installed uh, Bash, for example, in a upper layer, and then later on I upgraded Bash we can actually identify both versions of Bash that are installed and see exactly what layers are impacted. So in this case, we can see that this version of Bash has some vulnerabilities that were identified. And I can see that it was specifically this layer on which that vulnerability came in. And this is exactly where it is in the file system, that layer of the image. So that gives us some visibility into what exactly um, is really in our Docker image. So all this information is available from the user interface, but it's also available from the API and DTR. So if you're wanting to pull this information out in an automated fashion, it is all available for the scan results. The important part about building this build of materials that says what is in our image is so that we can quickly rescan these images. So as vulnerability database updates come out, we'll easily take that build of materials and then compare that to the new updates. The actual scan of the image initially is what takes the most time, but updating that build of materials and, uh, and actually taking the build of materials and comparing against the new CVE database is the quick part. So new updated database, rescan very quickly. So that's the scanning capabilities in the registry. So this can be either enabled from the standpoint of having it so that we automatically will scan our images on push or you can configure it so it's manually done either from the user interface or API. So we can also uh, synchronize the vulnerability database either in an online fashion. So I can pull this automatically from Docker Store, or I can manually specify that I want to upload a new version of my uh, image database. So a number of people have expressed that I would like to be able to pull this in in a fashion where my DTR is completely firewalled off. So we need to be able to have that, that interface here and that we, we can do from the UI or the API. So looking at the repositories, 
as you can see here, you can determine whether or not an image has been set to automatically scan on push or not. So by default, if you do upgrade a, an existing DTR, all of the images uh, that exist in your registry currently don't have the scan on push immediately enabled, but if you enable that on a per repository basis, so for example, if I go to my settings, I can either make it so it's automatically scanning on push and allowing it to do manually or manual only. So that's scanning. And feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section. I'll be happy to answer those. The next piece I wanted to talk about uh, comes in UCP, and that is specifically secrets management. So it, there's a common question that comes up. How do I get my, my configuration, my usernames, my passwords, my TLS keys, uh, my license files into my Docker images at runtime? You say I want to build my Docker image once and ship it anywhere, but what happens when I have dev, test, and production that have different configuration for, for different environments? And what happens if that changes? So I don't want to bake it into my image. And if I do put it in my image, that means that I have to rebuild my image to change that. So secrets really solves that problem from, one, pulling the secrets out of my Docker image so that even though images are portable, which is great, I don't pass around those secrets in my Docker image, and I can change these automatically at runtime. So looking here, I've actually pre-created some secrets for my dev, test, and production uh, application deployment. So just to actually see how the secret creation works, from the UI here, I can create the secret. So uh, we'll just call this demo, and I can put in my value here. So this can either be a you know, username, password, a key of any sort. It also can be binary data as well. From the UI, you can't exactly uh, input binary data, but from the API, we can insert you know, in a binary data, whether it's a, a, you know, a license key or um, you know, even actually be a binary piece of information up to 500 kilobytes. So if I just give this a, for example, uh, let's just give it foo as our value. So I can then set a permission label. So this determines who specifically has access to utilize this secret. So for instance, if I want to use this for my dev environment where my dev team has access, I can specify my Docker demo dev permission label. So then when I create that secret, it has been created, put into the RAF store as Vivek was, Vivek was talking about. And now the secret is available for utilization in an application. So let's actually utilize one of these secrets here. So really quickly, I'll create a service. So I will just call this demo, and I will use an image from my DTR. So I'm just going to use Alpine Linux for my example. And in this case, let's go ahead and just do a basic command to ping localhost, just because we just want a container running. So this is the important piece. This is how we determine whether or not a container does have access to a given resource, a secret. So here, if these permission labels match, that allows that container to have the appropriate access to my secret. So now I should be able to take this and run it. So I've created a service utilizing a secret. So in this case, it's not really a complete application. We're just running one replica of a container. So we can see our one container that's running. And let's actually inspect that. So to actually see this in motion, let's actually start a shell here. So this may be a little bit difficult to see, so let's zoom in a little bit. So if I go to run secrets inside my container, oops. Uh, looks like I don't have my secret. Just a second. Oh, sorry, I forgot to actually add my secret. So I knew I forgot something, it felt too quick. So if I look at my resources, I should be able to add my secret. I'm sorry, let's see. Oh, there we go, environment, sorry. So new feature, I haven't uh, looked at it that closely from the UI. I've mostly been doing it from the CLI. So here with our secret, we give it a, that secret name that we want, but we can actually name the secret inside of the container something different. Uh, so in this case, if I actually wanna make it username, for example, I can set it so that it'll be in var run username in my container. So you can also set what permissions you want. So by default here, it's going to have root as the user owner and group as the user owner and the file permission. So say I want it to be, uh, let's see, I'll just make it uh, 500 inside of the uh, 
inside of my container. So I'll go ahead and save that secret and let's go ahead and just update our service definition. So now with that getting updated, it should have a new task that is running here. So now if I inspect this task, let's try this again. So now if I run my shell to start my container. So now if we go to run secrets, so here we can see that we have the appropriate permissions. It's owned by root. And if I cat this, I can see that foo has been returned. So that's how the secret is able to get inside of the container. So I'll do a little bit more of a, a more practical demo of how the secrets work here in just a second. So in general, that's the overall workflow of how secrets get added into a container. So the next thing I want to touch on um, before I get into a more full demo of an application is the HTTP routing mesh. So one of the common questions is how do I route services externally to you know, either end users or other applications? What if I have applications that don't live in the Docker world today that need to talk to a service that is running in Docker? So one way to do that is to be able to route services utilizing something like, like HAProxy, Nginx. There are a number of open source projects that have built out workflows such as Interlock that allowed us to take containers, map them through a software-based load balancer that were Docker aware. And we've taken a lot of those patterns that have been commonly used and made it so it's an option that is enabled directly through the user interface. So if I go to admin settings and go to my routing mesh, it's as simple as checking a box to enable that routing mesh. You specify what ports you would like to be available for the routing mesh itself. So you can specify an HTTP and HTTPS port for your applications. Now these don't necessarily have to be the given end ports. A uh, common architecture that uh, we actually have a reference architecture built around the routing mesh as well. But a uh, common uh, architecture is to have some sort of load balancer in front of it, whether it's an elastic load balancer, something like an F5 or an Azure load balancer that actually sits in front of this HTTP routing mesh that would allow you to, for example, if you already have port 80 and 443 utilized, you can map those on the front end load balancer, but then make them available inside the cluster. So you can actually see that I have a few applications that have been already configured with the HTTP routing mesh. So I can see that these services are defined right here, and I can see what domain name they have been routed to. So, and then I get uh, information about that service to see whether or not it's been properly configured. So for example, if I navigate to this URL, see my demo application that's running in this environment, all routed directly from the end user hitting the application from the HTTP routing mesh. When we're hitting that HTTP routing mesh software load balancer, traffic is then routed to the service. So using the internal built-in IPVS functionality of the built-in swarm routing mesh, we're able to route that traffic to the individual containers where they're, they're load balanced um, from a VIP perspective with IPVS. So that allows me to provide that dynamic routing so that when I deploy new versions of my application, roll up to new containers, it will automatically take care of that so I don't have to go in, reconfigure my load balancer to point to a given port for a given container. So how exactly do we configure an app with the HTTP routing mesh? So let's look at a service. Let's go ahead and create one really quick. So if I want to take Nginx, for example, so if I take uh, an image from my Docker Trusted Registry. We'll use the official Nginx. So let's go ahead and configure this so that we have an application that's running with routing mesh. So the scheduling, we can leave by default. So let's just leave one container. But let's go ahead and look at the resources. So Nginx, in this case, is running inside the containers port 80. And for the public port, I'm just going to let it automatically assign. You can see that we have an add hostname based route this is how we can route our application um, based off of a, a specific host name or fully qualified domain name here, in this case, to be able to access the application. So in this case, I actually have a wildcard DNS for demo.dckr.org pointing to my cluster. So if I save this, 
So it gives me a warning saying that make sure I actually attach my uh, HTTP routing mesh network, so my UCP HRM network, to my application. So that will allow it to actually route the traffic specifically to my app. So now let's go ahead and deploy our application. So now my service has been deployed, so I can, should be able to see my task here. So it's up. And if I go back to my admin setting, let's go ahead and look at the routing mesh configuration so we can see that, yes, it's been configured. And now if I browse to this, I should see the default Nginx page. So here, we started that container, configured the routing mesh, and we're able to access that new application. So it can be as simple as that. A lot of automation, a lot of process, so my developers can go in, deploy their own application, so it's automatically routing to those services. Then the next thing that I wanted to talk about was role-based access control for secrets and volumes. So we've extended the role-based access control that exists as Vivek was talking about, and that's been extended for secrets. So secrets, as we were talking about earlier, has specific labels that have been defined to determine who actually has access to the secrets. So that limits the scope of who has access to a given secret so that, for example, if I have multiple uh, teams that are deploying their applications in UCP, they can only see the secrets that are specifically defined for them. So just to show what happens, let's go ahead and create a new secret and provide some data. And in this case, let me go ahead and set my staging label for my application. So now I've set that access label. So I now have that new secret with a different access label. And that this access control is still done by teams. So we can see in my Docker demo team that has been created, my demo2 user is a member of this team. We see that we have our staging label that is put in place. So for example, let's actually go ahead and remove that staging label. So now there's a label that's put in place where my user does not have access. So let's open up a new window here really quickly. And let's get logged in as my demo2 user. So my demo2 user isn't an admin. They have a restricted view into the cluster. So if we look at resources, that user can only see those applications that are relevant to them based off of their access control. So if we look at our secrets view, as you can see, I can see the secrets that have been granted access to me. So if I flip back here really quick and look at my secrets, that new secret that I just created, because I don't have the appropriate label, does not show up for my demo2 user. So there, we're able to limit who has access to those secrets. The same thing has been extended for volumes. So in this case, I can only see the volumes that are relevant to me based off of the labels that have been set. So if my user and their default permissions, they don't have access to be able to see any volumes that have not been shared with them through an access label. Whereas my admin can look at all the volumes that are available in the cluster. So we can see things like the Docs Trusted Registry uh, volume, but my regular user does not see that. So in that case, they can only attach volumes to their containers that they have specific access to. So another team could be deploying their applications, their databases here, and another team member from a different team cannot access the application data. So that's how we've extended that role-based access control. And again, the role-based access control is all controlled by labels. So here we're setting the, the labels on those resources to, to determine who has access to what. So how exactly do we put this all together? From the standpoint of configuring an application, getting that up and running, Docker Compose uh, YAML files become the standard for deploying applications. So we've extended that to give support for services and secrets. So to jump to the command line really quick, I actually have an application that I use for demos quite frequently. And in this case, I have a number of Docker Compose files that are, that are used for you know, various stages of, of what people are doing with their applications. In this case, let's look at our Docker Compose file that is configured for deploying my application into multiple environments, but using the version 3.1 format. So if you're familiar with Docker Compose in the YAML format, we can see that we have services that are defined. So in this case, this is a two-component application 
where it has a web application front end and a database. The database is at, at the very bottom of the screen. So what I have highlighted is that web app. So looking at things that we've been talking about, for example, if we're look, thinking about secrets, this application has been configured so that it needs to be able to talk to the database. So it has secrets configured in a way that it has access to the database user and database password, and it's setting the permissions such that it's setting them for read only with the mode. Then with things like the HTTP routing mesh, we want to route our web application so that it is automatically routed externally. The app inside the container runs on port 8080, and then we, we map internally and say, this application uses port 8080 internally. We want to route that externally to this host name, so docker demo dash environment. In this case, I'm using a bunch of environment variables here so that my CI system can automatically fill in these environment variables at runtime. So if you didn't know that you could use this as a form of templating, environment variables are a great way to achieve that. So you can deploy, for example, different versions of different applications from different registries, different tags, et cetera. So with that, we also do things like connect this container to the HRM network so that it can automatically be routed. Then our access control labels are also set. So the important thing I want to point out is this deploy section. So the deploy section specifically covers how do I define this as a service. So this uh, has extended that Docker Compose format so that the same Docker service create commands can be orchestrated through Docker Compose. So as you can see, there's quite a few options here. So if I had to run that Docker service create from the command line, there'd be a lot to remember or a lot to enter. So this provides a way that we can be just define this. So if I want to deploy this application, it's just a Docker stack deploy. So I also have my database defined here. So it's utilizing some of those same capabilities as well. In this case, we're not routing traffic to it, but I'm using things such as in my deploy configuration, I'm saying I want to deploy my database to my manager node. So in this case, I'm specifying those constraints to say swarm mode, place this on a node that is my one of my managers. So this can also be used for Docker engines to specify labels in a way that, for example, if I need an application that needs very fast disk to use for some sort of caching, I can add a label to that engine and use that as a constraint for deploy. So from that standpoint, this allows me to define everything that I need for my application. So we're able to take advantage of secrets, the HTTP routing mesh, utilizing our, our role-based access control for the secrets and volumes. So these secrets in this case are predefined, so they're external to the Docker Compose file so that they've already been created and they have the access control label already in place. So that's how we can take our Compose-based services and easily deploy them through the universal control plane, either from the user interface. So if we take a Compose file, in this case, if I had a Compose file that doesn't have environment variables, I can paste that in here and upload it or I can use the command line interface. So for example, I have a Jenkins job that does this for me. So if I want to deploy this, I select which environment, which version of my application, I do a build, and my job will run through and do my Docker stack deploy. So and that's it. it. Could be as easy as a Docker stack deploy to get your application up and running. So. I know we are coming up a bit on time, so if there are any questions, I would love to answer any. Sure, thank you so much, Matt, for that, um, for the demo. Now we're getting a lot of good feedback in the uh, the chat area here. I know initially, um, you know, we said we were gonna save the questions for the end of the, the presentation, but I think we were able to address like 99% of them um, within the Q&A chat group, so um, hopefully people were happy with those answers there. If there are more, what we want to do is, I know because we're coming up on the hour here, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, including Matt. Um, <clears throat> you can reach out to us. Like, I'll send out a follow-up email. You can feel free to respond to that. But, um, you know, my email is Christopher, just normal Christopher, dot H-I-N-E-S at docker.com. You can post any of those questions you'd like to me or, or to Matt as well. I can filter them to Matt or Vivek. Um, also, typically we do like a follow-up blog post, so we'll feature some of the, you know, the top Q&A questions that we received and, um, and provide some answers to those as well. All right, so I want to thank Matt and Vivek for being here. Matt, thank you so much for that demo, man.
Definitely. Thanks a lot. And I want to thank everyone for being here and spending the time to speak with us or listen to us um, hear about what's new in Docker Data Center. Um, hopefully it was enjoyable for you. If you have questions, again, reach out to me. Um, you can do a little more research on our website as well, you know, www.docker.com. Uh, there's a Docker Data Center page there. And um, we thank you for your support and um, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone.